chair recognizes the senator for West Virginia for up to one hour. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to, that I be allowed to proceed for the full hour. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, uh, this is my 11th uh, in my series of speeches on the line item veto. When Sulla had made himself master of Rome, he asked young Julius Caesar to repudiate his wife, Cornelia, the daughter of Senna. When Caesar refused to do so, Sulla considered having his name added to the proscription list, but he was induced by someone to spare his life. The dictator reluctantly consenting with the rejoinder that their sagacity was indeed small if they did not, in that boy, see many Mariuses. Caesar considered it to be prudent to withdraw from Rome to Rhodes, and he did not uh, return to Rome until uh, after Sulla's death. Caesar was chosen as quaestor in 68 BC and assigned to serve in Spain. In 65 BC, he was elected edile. In uh, 63 BC, he was elected Pontifex Maximus. In 62, Praetor. In 61 BC, he became pro praetor for Spain. And he led many brilliant military campaigns against the tribes until he had made the whole country tributary uh, to Rome and had sent much money to the public treasury at, uh, at Rome. In 60 BC, he uh, requested a triumph and also asked permission to stand as a candidate for the consulship uh, while uh, waiting outside the city to make a triumphal entry. Cato the Younger opposed this proposition and uh, used up the last day for the presentation of candidates in speech making. And he defeated Caesar's proposition. So here we see the example of an effective filibuster in the Roman Senate, 2,053 years ago. Caesar was therefore required to abandon his triumph on the one hand, or on the other, to enter the city and offer himself as a candidate for the consulship. He chose to abandon his triumph, enter the city, offered himself as a candidate, and was elected consul in 59 BC. Meanwhile, in 62 BC, we recall, a victorious Pompey had returned from the east after a succession of military and diplomatic achievements, and contrary to the expectations of some who feared that he would prove to be another Sulla, Pompey disbanded his army and entered Rome with no other retinue than his own personal staff. Thinking, uh, perhaps naively, that the oligarchy would give him his due, he pressed the Senate to ratify his arrangements that had been made in the East 
while he was uh, winning victories for Rome, and also to provide land grants for about 40,000 of his veterans who had retired from the legions. The Roman Senate, now that Pompey no longer had an army at his back, no longer feared him and rejected both of his requests. Bad matters were made worse when the Senate also offended Crassus and the equestrians by rejecting a request by the Publicani to modify the terms of a contract for the collection of taxes in the province of Asia. Now, these events rudely dashed Cicero's hopes for a concord of the orders. And taking full advantage of the situation, Julius Caesar in 60 BC formed uh, an unofficial coalition for power sharing with Pompey and Crassus, known as the first triumph, uh, triumvirate. It was an important turning point on the road to one man rule in Rome. And uh, was caused by the failure of the Roman Senate to see that it was throwing these three men together. So because of this intransigent and unrealistic uh, senatorial policy, these three men formed the, the triumvirate, the first triumvirate. Caesar had been elected consul in 59 BC, and he immediately began to fulfill his commitments to his partners in the triumvirate. He brought in a law to provide lands for Pompey's veterans, and he brought in another law ratifying the arrangements that Pompey had made in the East while fighting Rome's wars there. Although uh, much of Caesar's legislation was determined by the interests of the uh, triumvirate, he was also the author of some constructive legislation. One law, for example, uh, provided uh, protection for people in the Roman provinces against extortion by Roman officials. Among the innovations uh, of Caesar, I perhaps should mention one that may be of a little more than passing interest uh, here. This was a law that provided for the publication of senatorial resolutions in a kind of congressional record to prevent the garbling of official documents by unscrupulous magistrates. This record of senatorial proceedings was also meant to bring the Senate under public scrutiny. These uh, Acta diurna, or daily doings, were posted on the walls of the forums 
And from these walls, the reports were copied and sent by messengers throughout all parts of it, Italy and the outlying provinces. This again might be of interest to uh, our friends in the Senate as we've discussed doing away with the congressional record, doing away with uh, bulk mail to our constituents. So that we, we seem to be going in the opposite direction from the direction in which Caesar was leading the Roman Senate at that, that, at that time. But also during consuls, uh, Caesar's consulship, he laid the foundations for his future career by having a henchman named uh, Publius Vatinius propose a law that was passed by the tribal assembly conferring upon Caesar the combined provinces of Cisalpine Gaul and Illyricum. Cisalpine Gaul and Illyricum. For a term of five years, from that date, which would extend to March 1, 54 BC. In that same year, 59 BC, during Caesar's being consul, the governor of Transalpine Gaul, Gaul across the Alps, the governor of Transalpine Gaul died. And the Roman Senate, under pressure from Pompey, added that province to, Caesar, to Caesar's command and gave him one more legion in addition to the garrison of three legions that he received as a result of being assigned the command of, of uh, Cisalpine Gaul and Illyricum. Caesar had greatly strengthened his position. He not only held a proconsular command in an area that offered the prospects for his winning military laurels, but the length of that term, five years, assured him of immunity from uh, being charged with any unconstitutional acts during 59, the year of, of uh, his consulship. Before he left for Gaul in 58 BC, Caesar selected a young aristocrat, Publius Clodius Pulcher. U-L-C-H-E-R, to act as his agent during his absence. Whatever Caesar's original intention had been, his action resulted, figuratively speaking, in his tossing a firebrand into the uh, volatile city affairs. Rarely, if ever, had such a violent demagogue been seen in Rome. Clodius demolished venerable constitutional safeguards. He attacked the Senate. He converted low-priced grain for the Romans into a free dough. So for the first time, we now see the free dough, at great cost to the Roman treasury. He uh, collected gangs of thugs. He uh, 
disrupted the social order, and he sent Cicero into exile. Uh, Caesar was prevailed upon by Pompey, however, to pardon Cicero, but Clodius delayed Cicero's return to Rome several months by uh, bloody riots, which continued even after uh, his arrival, Cicero's arrival back in, in Rome. A meeting took place uh, at uh, Lucca in northern Italy in 56 BC, where Caesar renewed his pact with Crassus and Pompey. They agreed that Pompey should be made governor of uh, Spain, that Crassus should be made governor of Syria, while Caesar, when his five-year term as governor expired, as governor of Gaul, would have his five-year term extended for an additional five years to March 1, 49 BC. Caesar then hurried off to Gaul. And in 55 BC, he crossed the Rhine for a brief show of force. And then in that same year of 55 BC, Caesar invaded Britain. He returned to Britain in 54 BC, the following year, and vanquished the Britons in the battle. Rome had known Julius Caesar as a spendthrift, a rake, and a politician. But Rome was now amazed to find that Caesar was also a very able and tireless administrator and a very resourceful general. Caesar showed himself at this time to be also a historian. And in the midst of his vigorous campaigns in Gaul, he wrote a record of the Gallic Wars and the conciseness and simplicity of these accounts constitute uh, one of the great classics in military literature. By his own account, Caesar could be merciful And he could be cruel. For example, after he had defeated the Atuatuchi, he wrote that he had the entire population sold at auction in one lot. And the purchaser's returns showed a total of 53 thousand souls. After the siege of uh, Bourges, Caesar wrote that his troops made, those, made no distinction between the aged and women and children. Indeed, the whole population of some 40,000, he wrote, except for a bare 800 who had fled at the first alarm. 
got through. Only 800 escaped out of some 40,000 people. They escaped the sword. When Caesar began his eight-year-long Gallic Wars, Rome's only communication with Spain with its, with its, with its holdings in Spain was along this narrow strip of the French Mediterranean coast controlled by Rome. Using Roman superior discipline and, in and engineering skills, Caesar attacked and defeated each independent tribe separately. And by the time the various tribes allied themselves uh, to attack Roman forces, it was too late. Caesar's victories had greatly extended Rome's enlightened influences and paved the way, ultimately, for Caesar's seizure of power in Rome. All of Gaul, all of Gaul, as far north as the Rhine River, had now been subjected to Rome. And for the next 300 years, Gaul remained a Roman province. Let me pause just a moment to reflect Back 11 weeks ago, we spoke of Rome as being a tiny, fledgling, little, rural community on the Tiber River back in 753 BC. Now we have seen Rome extend its dominions to include Spain, Gaul, the Balearic Islands, Carthage, Sicily, Sardinia. Illyricum. Macedonia, Greece, Pergamum, Asia Minor, Bithynia. Pontus, Pontus, Syria, Judea. A city state was simply not equipped to administer such a sprawling empire. And the strains on Rome's resources, as we can imagine, were great especially on her manpower. Well, in any event, in uh, 54 BC, Pompey's wife, Julia, who was Caesar's daughter, died, and thus severed an important bond between Caesar and uh, Pompey. By then, Crassus was on his way to attack the Parthians. He crossed the Euphrates River 
and at Kare, Kara, a superior Parthian cavalry defeated Crassus. His son fell in the battle. Crassus was withdrawing his forces when the Parthian leader invited him to a conference. Crassus went, and he was treacherously slain. His head was sent to the Parthian court. And only a few thousand men in his now leaderless army lived to return to Syria. A balancing force as a result of the debacle, debacle of Crassus and his army had been removed for a victorious Crassus might have opposed the dictatorship of either Pompey or Caesar. So whereas we had a triumvirate, now we have two, two rivals remaining. And while these two uh, potential dictators were maneuvering for position, all of Rome was filled with the odor of a dying republic. The verdicts of juries, the offices of magistrates, the votes of the assembly were sold to the highest bidders. And where money failed, murder was available. William Durant writes that crime flourished in the city. Brigandage in the country. And no police force existed to control it. The lowest elements in Italy were attracted to Rome by the smell of money or the gift of corn. And uh, any man who voted as he was paid was admitted to the rolls, regardless of whether he was a citizen or not. In modern day parlance around here, one might say in thinking of that time in Rome that what they needed was a good campaign financing reform law. Gang warfare raged throughout Rome. We hear much about gang warfare here in this city and in other cities of the land. Clodius, we'll remember, who was Caesar's agent, was murdered by a rival gang led by Titus Aeneas Pep Pepanius Milo, who had been engaged by Caesar's rival, Pompey. A century of civil wars, as we have followed them, 
from week to week, beginning back there in 133 BC when we talked about Tiberius Gracchus. A century of civil war, wars and revolution had broken down a selfish, arrogant oligarchy, but had put no other government in its place. We've seen the weakening of the Roman Senate. Unemployment, bribery, bread, and circuses corrupted the magistrates, the assembly, and the Senate. Rome was uh, at the mercy of an ill-informed and passion-ridden mob, which was incapable of ruling itself, much less an empire. In 49 BC, Caesar's term as governor would end. And he would be unable to run for consul until the fall of that year. In the interval, he would lose his immunity as an office holder. <coughs> and would not be able to enter Rome without being charged and tried by his political enemies. Cato, as a matter of fact, had already frankly expressed the hope that Caesar would be accused and tried and banished from Italy. And through his friends in the Senate, Caesar proposed that he be given permission to stand as a candidate for consul in absentia. The Senate refused to consider the motion and demanded that he dismiss his troops. Caesar made a counterproposal. Strange to say, he had no right to propose the conditions on which he would lay down his command. But he made a counterproposal that both he and Pompey should lay down their commissions. The Senate supported the proposal, but Pompey balked at it. And in the last days of the year 50 BC, the Senate declared Julius Caesar a public enemy, unless he should abandon his command by July 1 of the next year. Well, things went from bad to worse. And there was a long debate in the Roman Senate, at the end of which the Senate, persuaded by Cato and others, voted to make Sulla, uh, Pompey, dictator, and voted him the money to collect a large army throughout Italy. It was not expected that uh, Caesar would be able to assemble his legions uh, for a few weeks, before which time uh, he would not be a major threat to Rome. But Caesar decided to seize the initiative and to move quickly. And on January 10 or 11, depending upon whether it was before midnight or after midnight, in the year 49 BC, Caesar crossed the Rubicon, a small stream near Ariminum, separating the rest of Italy from the southern boundaries of uh, Cisalpine Gaul. Plutarch says that 
Before crossing the stream, Caesar stood silently for a while on its banks, and then he began discussing the situation, reflecting on the dangers that would accompany the attempt which he was about to make. And they, that he changed his mind many times. Then at last, by some sudden impulse, Plutarch says, Caesar cried out, the die is cast, and immediately passed over the stream and reached a, a remnant before daybreak and took it. The rest of his legions were expected to join him uh, later. Now, all of Italy then became, became a, a state of turmoil. Bad news travels fast, and a wave of hysteria swept over Rome. Every new report was a report about the taking of this city or that city, and Pompey had no way to gain correct intelligence as to what was going on. Every report that was brought in, it was a report that this or that person out in the country had picked up. So we, we can imagine, as Plutarch says, the mass historia. Those who lived outside the city fled from, from all quarters into the city. And those who were inside the city abandoned it in as much haste. Plutarch says that uh, Pompey took the two consuls and fled. And that most of the senators snatched up those things in their houses that were next at hand and joined him, Pompey, uh, in his flight. What a miserable spectacle was the city then, says Plutarch. In so dreadful a tempest, like a ship abandoned by its pilots, tossed about at all adventures and at the mercy of the winds and seas. Well, Caesar pursued Pompey, who, because he was the leader then of the Republican forces, had sent part of his army and the two consuls across the Adriatic to Derachium. Caesar would have followed him, followed him but uh, he was unable to do so. Pompey sailing from Brundisium upon the approach of Caesar and joining uh, the rest of his army in Macedonia. Plutarch says that uh, Caesar returned to Rome after having reduced all of Italy without spilling a drop of blood. Caesar then forced the doors of the public treasury and uh, told Metellus, a young tribune who sought to keep Caesar from going into the treasury. When Metellus cited certain laws that were against it, Caesar said, arms and laws do not flourish together. 
and he threatened to slay Metellus if he didn't stand aside. Caesar sent for workmen, they broke open the doors, and Caesar uh, supplied himself with all the resources that he would need to fight the war. He then uh, proceeded to defeat Pompey's forces in Spain so that he would not have an army at, at his back when he later would uh, proceed against Pompey. And upon his return from Spain, the rump senate made him dictator. This was in the year 49 B.C. After taking certain actions, such as uh, recalling all those who were in exile and relieving debtors by canceling part of the interest on their debt, Caesar laid down his dictatorship after 11 days. He then caused himself to be declared consul along with uh, Publius Servilius Isauricus, and then left Rome to prosecute the war. Even though it was in the midst of winter and Pompey controlled the Adriatic, Caesar was able at great risks to move his army across the Adriatic and to engage Pompey's forces in battle. At Derachium, Caesar was defeated by Pompey. But Pompey failed to deliver the finishing stroke. He sent his army right up to the camp of Caesar after Caesar's defeat. But uh, Plutarch says that for some unknown reason, either through too much caution or the caprice of fortune, instead of delivering that finishing stroke, Pompey sounded the retreat. And that night, Caesar said to his men, this day, victory would have declared for the enemy if they had had a general who knew how to conquer. Caesar retreated uh, with his defeated army into Thessaly, followed by Pompey. Pompey, whose fleet of 500 large ships and many more smaller ones, controlled uh, the, the, sea, the, the lines of supply from the sea. Uh, but he favored a protraction of the war by avoiding an all-out battle with Caesar's troops, who, although they were greatly outnumbered, were seasoned veterans and they were supremely dedicated to their leader, Caesar. Now, Pompey made a decision that would cost him his life. Although he fav favored the old Fabian strategy, which had been used against Hannibal by Fabius, although he favored this strategy of delay, his officer corps, made up of senators and other aristocrats, was overly confident. They had just defeated Caesar's forces. But Pompey thought it best to delay. He knew he could control the lands of supply. He knew that after a little while, Caesar's forces would run out of supply. 
and would become famished, threatened with hunger. But Pompey says, not a man agreed with, uh, Plutarch says that not a man agreed with Pompey, except Cato. And they taunted Pompey with criticism, aspersions of uh, cowardice. And so piqued by these reproaches, Pompey, against his own better judgment, gave the order to do battle. As the uh, battle lines were forming on the plains of Pharsalia, Caesar saw a trusty centurion and calling him by name said, What cheer, Caius Christinus? How think you do we stand? Caesar replied the veteran in a bold accent and stretching out his hand, this day you will gain a glorious victory. As for me, whether alive or dead, I shall deserve the praises of Caesar. And so the centurion departed and led his company you know, with a bold, daring, and great, and pressed the enemy with great fierceness until one of Pompey's men saw him approaching and waited to receive him and thrust his sword in at his mouth with such force that it came out at the nape of his neck. Christinus was killed, but Caesar's troops were victorious. The Battle of Pharsalia uh, had been fought on August the 9th, 48 BC. Pompey and his uh, forces had been routed, after which Caesar had uh, taken over Pompey's camp and killed all those who were left in charge of it, most of whom were slaves. Pompey then fled to Larissa. where he took ship to Egypt. Having been joined by his wife Cornelia and his son, Pompey was stabbed to death by the Egyptians when he set foot on the Egyptian shore. And his assassination was seen by his wife on the vessel that had brought them to Egypt. And she was able to escape the pursuing Egyptians only with the help of a brisk gale. Thus, Mr. President, was the sad end of Pompey the Great. Caesar pursued Pompey to Egypt, but of course arrived too late. Caesar was involved in a war then with uh, Ptolemy the 13th, the result of which was the defeat of Ptolemy and his death by drowning, and the establishment of Cleopatra the seventh, Ptolemy's sister, and now Caesar's mistress on the throne as queen. Plutarch tells us that Cleopatra later bore Caesar a son named Caesarion. Plutarch also tells us about how Cleopatra was removed from the city by Photinus, the Egyptian vizier, 
and how in the dusk of evening she returned to the city in a small boat and rolled herself up in a carpet and was carried uh, like a bale of goods by Apollodorus, a Sicilian, through the gates of the palace uh, to Caesar. After uh, Caesar defeated the Egyptians, he uh, proceeded into Asia Minor, where he defeated Pharnaces II, we will recall in our last speech, who was the son of Mith Mithridates VI, Jupiter. Caesar defeated Pharnaces II at the Battle of Zella. The British would say Zela in 47 BC. This was the battle that occasioned the famous boast by Caesar Vini, vidi, vici. Vini, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. On April the 6th, 46 BC, Caesar met and conquered the combined Pompeian forces of Metellus Scipio, Cato, Titus, Labienus, and Juba the first, the king of the Numidians. At Thapsus on the eastern co coast of northeast Africa, or I perhaps should say southeast of Utica, almost directly south of Carthage. After the battle, Juba committed suicide. Scipio fled and later died by drowning. But Cato managed to escape with a portion of his army. How much longer do I have, Mr. Pedro? I think, sir. Uh, Cato escaped with uh, a portion of his army to Utica. Utica, just a bit northwest of Carthage. Later, Cato's officers wanted to defend Utica against Caesar, but Cato persuaded them that it was impossible. He urged all Romans to flee and he offered to provide funds for their flight. But he urged his own son to submit to Caesar. Cato, however, rejected both courses. Upon Caesar's approach, Cato spent the evening in philosophical discussion then retired to his room and read Plato's Phaedo, a dialogue on the immortality of the soul. His friends uh, had suspicions that Cato would kill himself, and they removed his sword from his bedside. Cato demanded that it be returned and it was sent back into his room by a little boy. Cato examined the sword, found the point and the edge good, and then said, now I am master of myself. Then he picked up the book again and read it some more, after which Plutarch says that he slept until almost midnight. And when he awakened, he called uh, two of his freedmen, Cleanthes, a physician, 
and Bootus. He uh, asked Bootus to go to the port and determine whether or not all the Romans had gotten off the sea and to bring him word. When Bootus uh, returned and informed him that everyone had gotten off with the exception of one individual who was briefly de detained by personal business, Cato fell again into a little slumber. And then as the slender fingers of dawn began to pierce the black veil of the night and the birds began to sing. Cato drew the sword and plunged it into his abdomen. His friends rushed into the room. The physician began to sew up the wound. But as Cato came a little to himself, he thrust the physician away and tore open the wound and uh, expired immediately. Cato died when he was 48 years old. A man whose constitutionalism was a mixture of Stoicism and old Roman virtues. A constitutionalism that was genuine. Well, after a few months, a few weeks, Caesar returned to Rome in the fall of 46 BC, where a frightened Senate voted him the dictatorship for 10 years. And two years later, made him dictator for life. Caesar, through many feasts, entertained the people. Upon one occasion, he, he, he set 22,000 tables. And then he had another war to fight, so he went off in 45 to Munda in Spain and uh, defeated the two sons of Pompey. The older son was killed, the younger son escaped. And after the battle, Caesar said that he had often fought for victory, but this was the only time that he had had to fight for his life. He returned to Rome, and as dictator, he enlarged the Senate from 600 members to 900. He reformed uh, the local government, and he introduced the Julian calendar in 46 BC by making that a year of 15 months. Uh, free corn, the supply of free corn was radically reduced, and uh, Caesar also attempted to settle more men on small farms uh, throughout Italy. He uh, had all power. There was no authority, military, legislative, administrative, or financial authority in Rome that Caesar did not completely control. He had the power to declare war or peace without consulting the Senate, the great, the once great Roman Senate. And all of, and, and Caesar controlled the power of the purse, complete power over the purse, which at one time, as we recall, the Roman Senate controlled. Not a soldier could be paid without the Senate's approval of the funds. Caesar was above the law. No magistrate could be sworn into office except he first swore that he would uphold the acts of Caesar. Caesar was master of Rome. Caesar was master of the Senate. Caesar was master of all Italy. Caesar was master of the Roman world. But Caesar's mastery would end on the Ides of March 44 BC abruptly 
when the blood from three and twenty wounds flowed from Caesar's veins to extinguish his life and to stain the pedestal of Pompey in the Roman Senate House. Yeah. Proof, once again, that by diverse means, all men come to the same end. I yield the floor.